Concurrent training refers to an exercise program that combines both resistance and aerobic training sessions. This approach is particularly popular among individuals looking to improve both body composition, such as reducing their body fat and increasing muscle mass. While concurrent training can be effective for these goals, research suggests that incorporating aerobic exercise into a resistance training program may impair muscle strength and hypertrophy adaptations, or at least to a lesser extent than simply resistance training alone. This effect known as the interference effect can manifest both acutely through decreased performance just day to day and chronically through impaired muscle adaptations. Now, despite concerns about the interference effect hindering resistance training adaptations, research indicates that a well-designed aerobic training program can help mitigate these effects. Strategies to minimize the interference effect include limiting aerobic exercise to shorter durations of around 30 to 40 minutes and or scheduling aerobic sessions at least three hours apart from resistance training. Now, the type of aerobic exercise can also be crucial in minimizing the interference. For example, cycling tends to cause less interference than running, possibly because it leads to lower levels of muscle damage and soreness. Though these findings have been mixed. Performing higher intensity interval training may further reduce the interference, as its neuromuscular adaptations are more similar to those to resistance training. Now, for athletes aiming to maximize resistance training gains, circuit resistance training might be more of an effective alternative to traditional aerobic exercise. This approach aligns with the principles of specificity, increases total resistance training volume, and may promote hypertrophy and strength more effectively than conventional aerobic workouts. Consequently, incorporating circuit resistance training in place of traditional aerobic exercise could lead to greater improvements in muscular performance and body composition. Given the variety of concurrent training methods available, there is still a need for more research to determine the optimal programming strategies that maximize body composition and performance while minimizing the interference effect. And with that said, a recent study by Dolan and colleagues aimed to contribute to this growing body of literature by comparing different concurrent training strategies and a circuit resistance training program to a group that performed resistance training alone, focusing specifically on muscle strength and hypertrophy outcomes. Group one was the resistance training alone group. Group two was the concurrent training with high intensity interval training. Group three was the concurrent training with moderate intensity cycling. And group four was the resistance training barbell circuit. Now here's a closer look at each group's weekly training schedule. In the resistance training group, which consisted of six individuals, this group focused exclusively on resistance training with no aerobic training at all. Resistance training sessions are conducted on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. In the second group, which is the concurrent training with high intensity group, this group combined resistance training with high intensity interval cycling. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, participants completed 10 cycling intervals with a one to two work to rest ratio. Resistance training sessions are held on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with varying training intensities. The third group was the concurrent group with moderate intensity and consisted of five participants. This group alternated between resistance training and moderate intensity steady state cycling. The participants performed 30 minutes of steady state cycling on a Tuesday and Thursday. And the last group was the resistance training group with a total of six participants. This group integrated resistance training with 30 minutes of barbell circuit training on a Tuesday and Thursday without any additional aerobic training. All the concurrent training groups trained five days per week, while the resistance training group trained three times per week. All the groups followed the same daily undulating resistance training protocol on non-consecutive days, which were Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The resistance training program included the back squat and the bench press as the primary exercises, with the barbell overhead press, the barbell bent over row, and the barbell biceps curl as accessory exercises. The concurrent training groups perform their specific aerobic training modalities on the days between the resistance training sessions, with each session controlled for time, which was around 30 minutes per session. Before and after the intervention period, researchers assessed a one repetition max for strength on the squat and the bench press, as well as muscle thickness in the quadriceps and the chest. The study's timeline included an introductory training week, which was one week, followed by the main training program for weeks two through to seven, and concluded with the taper and the post-study testing during week eight. So let's take a look at the key findings of this study. All groups experienced significant increases in their squat one rep max strength, which ranged from 16.88 kilograms to 25.54 kilograms. Now for the bench press, their one rep max strength increased from 4.84 to 11.86, with no statistic differences between the groups for either of these outcomes. All groups showed significant increases in quadricep muscle thickness with no significant differences between groups at any of the three quadricep sites and regions. 
Interestingly, all groups except the resistance training group experienced significant increases in their pec major muscle thickness, which was an unexpected result. The programming effectively increased quadricep muscle thickness without causing any detrimental interference effect from the anaerobic exercise modalities or the circuit resistance training program. However, upper body training results were less consistent in producing increases in chest muscle thickness. Now, this inconsistency may be partly attributed to one of the study's main limitations, which was the small sample size. With only 25 participants or five to six per group, any significant outliers could have greatly influenced the mean values for each group. Additionally, the study's results are specific to college-aged males in a normocaloric energy balance, leaving uncertainty about whether these findings apply to other populations or individuals in a calorie deficit. Nevertheless, the data supports that when aerobic exercise is carefully integrated with resistance training, major strength and hypertrophy gains are not likely to be compromised. Now, based on these findings, here are my practical takeaways. Number one, effective integration of aerobic and resistance training. Incorporating well-designed aerobic exercise alongside resistance training does not significantly hinder strength or hypertrophy gains. This suggests that athletes or fitness enthusiasts can include aerobic workouts in their routines without sacrificing major muscle development or strength adaptations. Number two, consider circuit resistance training. Circuit resistance training can be a viable alternative to traditional aerobic exercise. It aligns with specificity principles, it increases total resistance training volume, and it may enhance hypertrophy and strength more effectively than conventional aerobic workouts. Number three, tailor aerobic exercise to minimize interference. To minimize potential interference with resistance training gains, consider programming shorter aerobic sessions of around 30 minutes and separating them from resistance training by at least three hours. High intensity interval training or cycling may be preferable to running due to the lower muscle damage and muscle soreness experienced. And last but not least, be aware of sample size limitations. Small sample sizes in studies can impact the reliability of results. When applying findings to broader populations, consider that individual responses may vary and results may not be directly extrapolated to different demographics or states of energy balance. And number five, maintain flexibility in your training approach. Given the variability in outcomes, it's beneficial to remain flexible in your training approaches. Adjust your programming as needed based on your personal progress and goals, and be open to experimenting with different training modalities to find out what works best for individual needs.